presented by Caltech. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Konstantin Batygin. Konstantin is an assistant professor of planetary science here at Caltech. He was born in Russia and partly educated in Japan, but speaks English with a California beach bum accent <laughs> since he got his undergraduate education at UC Santa Cruz. When he applied to Caltech to be a graduate student here, we were not sure what to make of him. But we accepted him and he came and we have no regrets. Less than four years later, he completed his PhD here. At that time, we did something very unusual for us. We offered him a faculty position here at Caltech. And to our delight, he accepted, and we have no regrets. <laughs> we did send him off for a year or two to our uh, farm team in Harvard to get a bit of seasoning. <laughs> Constantin works mainly on planetary dynamics, a subject that has its roots in something very classical, celestial mechanics, which has to do with the behavior of bodies interacting under gravity. In the simplest version of it, bodies that are treated as point masses a very classical problem, some aspects of which are still unsolved. Indeed, in Constantin's very first paper, he worked on a problem of long standing, the stability of the solar system. And here at Caltech, both as a student and subsequently as a faculty member, he has continued his passionate interest in planetary dynamics, though he has worked on other things as well a wide variety of problems that involve various aspects of planets, including magnetic fields, the disks from which planets form, and so on. A very rich set of problems motivated to a significant extent by the remarkable explosion in information that we have received in the past decade or so about planets around other stars. One of the interesting features of the way that Constantin does science is that he's working on problems that many people would seek to solve by throwing them at a computer, by running a big computer code. Constantin's not afraid of computers, but one of the distinctive features of his style of doing science is that wherever possible, he tries to do things with pencil and paper or on the blackboard. And this, of course, is the way that you get a deeper insight into what is going on. Uh, it also means that he is an excellent teacher. I should mention an aspect of Constantin that does not have to do with the science, and that is that he is the lead singer of a band. <laughs> it's called The Seventh Season. Google it, but do so after the show. <laughs> As for this show, it's not going to be hard rock, although there are some aspects of chaos in it. <laughs> it is perhaps music of the spheres, although you can debate whether Planet Nine is in harmony with the rest or even whether it's playing in the same band. But with no further ado, let me now ask Constantin to come out and give his presentation. Please welcome Constantin. Thanks very much. Thank you. It's a, it's a really special moment for me to be introduced by Dave when I was a grad student here, which, by the way, I always wondered how I got in. Now I know. Uh, it was a close call, uh, rightfully so. Um, when I was a grad student, Dave was my, uh, was my mentor, my, my PhD advisor. And before we dive into all this, I just want to tell a quick story 
But the first time ever, I talked to Dave and went like this. I walked into his office and I said, Dave, uh, I'm Constantine. I want to do some research. And Dave said, you know what you should do? You should um, calculate the magnetic Reynolds number for a highly irradiated exoplanet atmosphere. So why don't you do that and then come back and we'll talk. I was like, I don't even know what a regular Reynolds number is, let alone a magnetic one. Um, anyway, I spent like the day uh, figuring out what Dave was talking about. And at the end of the day, I calculated it, and the answer was three. So with <laughs> swagger, I walked back into Dave's office and said, the answer is three. And Dave said, three? No way. I don't believe it. And then he stared blankly into space for like five seconds. And he was like, yeah, I also get three. Um, <laughs> so, like, what is this place? You know, what, how, um, so anyway, now that I'm a prof, I um, do the, exactly the same thing. I tell my grad students, why don't you go calculate something? And then I spend all day calculating. But when they come back, you know, I pretend I did it in my head. Um, <laughs> all right. So speaking of, uh, speaking of exoplanets, right, over the last uh, couple decades, the number of planets that we have discovered around other stars has just been staggering. Thousands of planets around other stars. Really interesting stuff. But meanwhile, in the solar system, we've been losing, OK? In 2006, we went from nine planets to eight planets, right? We lost a planet. So today, I would like to talk about how to make the solar system great again and restore it <laughs> to its former rightful nine planet glory. OK. So this is work I should acknowledge uh, done alongside my uh, friend and also mentor, Mike Brown. Um, and before we talk about 2016, let's sort of turn the clock back a little bit to the year 1781, which was the first time this, uh, a planet was discovered in the solar system. And it was discovered by a guy named Herschel. Um, simply through the meticulous process of using the telescope to look at the night sky and just make a drawing of what he saw. So in principle, discovering objects in the solar system is kind of easy, right? The, the kind of basic idea is that night after night, galaxies and stars that are far away don't move relative to one another, but things in the solar system move ever so slightly. So Herschel discovered the first big object that moved across the night sky and said, great, this is a new planet of the solar system. We will call it George. Okay, so we can have right, Earth, Venus, you know, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and George. Um, <clears throat> so the, the astronomical community did not exactly agree and said, we will, instead of calling it George, call it Uranus. Um, so one of the remarkable things about George was that uh, immediately upon his discovery, astronomers realized that it had been spotted a bunch of times before, right? Uh, numerous astronomers had jotted it down and didn't recognize that it was a moving star, right? They just kind of drew it. So immediately after the formal discovery, of Uranus, its orbit was reconstructed by going to legacy observations. And something that astronomers noted is that it was deviating away from its predicted path. Here's a set of tables, which was published in 1821, uh, rather compiled uh, in 1821 by Alexis Bovard, who was the um, director of the Parisian Observatory. And as you can uh, clearly see, from this slide, um, Uranus is not where it's supposed to be, right? <laughs> there is sines and cosines over here on the left-hand side, and there's a table, some French words, and pluses and minuses. So what people that speak French tell me is that in here, what Bouvard writes is that, uh, as a good theorist, I will not dismiss the possibility that the data is bad. Right? After all, it's just astronomers drawing what they saw at night. Who knows? Uh, I said, but let's sort of, for the sake of argument, also consider the possibility that the data is right and that Uranus really is deviating away from its predicted course. 
What would that mean? That would mean that there exists another planet in the solar system that is gravitationally perturbing it, that is causing it to go off course. So this was, again, 1821. Like I said, I don't speak French, but I have enough skill to, uh, to find the word Uranus, and it appears here <laughs> at another, another spot on the slide. So at least I know that they're ta this is the right page where they're talking about Uranus. Um, so the promise of this data, the promise of Bavard's tables didn't come to fruition for about 20 years. It took more than two decades for the promise of using existing data, the, the deviation from the predicted path of Uranus to, to lead to the discovery of the next uh, object. And um, the man who's typically credited with the discovery, the theoretical discovery of Neptune is this guy, Orban Le Verrier, who lived between 1811 and 1877. Now, to, uh, to the untrained eye, he looks like a pretty fancy French guy, but as Dave mentioned, when I was an undergrad, I lived in Santa Cruz, kind of a questionable part of Santa Cruz, so I can spot a gangsta from afar. <laughs> and it's absolutely clear that Le Verrier was a gangsta because um, his, his bling, right? He's wearing his bling on the outside. His stage name is Urban. So uh, I went through the process of reconstructing what he actually looked like, which is this. And by the way, you too can download the Thug Life app onto your iPhone. And uh, yeah, we, you know, they work, they work assistant professors hard here, right? Um, so this is what, this is a m page from uh, Le Verrier's manuscript where he went through the calculation, the, the painful, meticulous calculation of using existing locations, right, existing observations of where Uranus was in the night sky to deduce where the next planet was. Um, it took years for him to complete his calculation, and interestingly, at the same time, there was uh, another gentleman by uh, the, with the last name Adams in England who basically had the same set of calculations, um, but got scooped by Le Verrier. Um, and this is, what, uh, this is what happened. In 1846, when Le Verrier completed his, um, his prediction, he went to Paris to the, uh, to the observing crowd, right, where I gave this big talk, where in the audience there were lots of observational astronomers, where he tried to explain to them exactly where the next planet is. He said, Neptune is like right there. All you have to do is find it. Please, someone find it. And in the, uh, in the audience there were some big names, Airy, for example, of course, a very famous geophysicist of the time, who said, I cannot attempt to convey the impression which was made on me by the author's undoubting confidence, but the firmness with which he proclaimed to the observing astronomers, look into the place which I have indicated and you will see the planet well. So Le Verrier was absolutely certain that his prediction was right. And remarkably, he generated very little enthusiasm among the observing astronomers because they said, you know, you're kind of making us, asking us for a big commitment. Like, we have to stay up at night, all night, okay? Like, it's not easy to do. Um, so interestingly, Neptune was not discovered by a French astronomer observationally. Le Verrier uh, had sent a telegram to Gal, who was a German, uh, observer, observer, and Gal uh, put together this plan for finding Neptune, and on the first night of their observational campaign, the sky went dark, they opened up the dome, and within an hour found Neptune. Right? It's just remarkable. It was probably, it's probably one of the most remarkable um, instances where theoretical calculations lead, led to something that was kind of immediately and very immediately observable and very dramatic. Another really interesting thing about Le Verrier's miracle was that it was all about timing. The reason it worked was because it happened in 1846. Okay? 
So both Leverrier and Adams assumed the so-called Bode's law for the size of the orbit, right? They said, uh, so in the solar system, things are roughly spaced in a geometrical sequence. So by that assumption, okay, with that assumption built into the calculations, the predicted orbits that both Adams and Leverrier got were these big circles on the slide, whereas the real Neptune is the smaller orbit, okay? But they got the location in the night sky correctly because Neptune and Uranus were almost at conjunction in 1846. So it's all about, it, science is just like show business. It's all about timing, right? It's all about being in the right place at the right time. So in the modern day, you don't have to spend years doing this type of a calculation. You can use um, computer algebra. And if, you will, if all of this was happening in 2011, which is, by the way, exactly one Neptunian year later, right? Neptune completed one revolution since 1846. Adams would have predicted um, Neptune to be here, and Leverrier would have predicted it to be there. So they would still have um, gotten the correct uh, notion that indeed a planet exists beyond Uranus, but it wouldn't, wouldn't have been nearly as dramatic. They wouldn't have gotten the part of the night sky where to observe it correctly. So I'm not the first person to point this out. In fact, this was first I think pointed out by this uh, hipster from Harvard College Observatory who said Leverrier's calculation is nothing but a happy accident. Uh, and he, together with Parseval Lowell, if my understanding of the history is correct, set out to find the next planet using the same methodology. And he said, now that we know that this method works, you can discover planets with math rather than the telescope, uh, then we can just keep on doing this, right? So, and in fact, Leverrier's Neptune, uh, even the observed Neptune, didn't fully resolve all of the issues with, uh, with the Uranian orbit. Uranian or it resolved most of them, but Uranus was still deviating away a little bit from its predicted path. So chasing those residuals, um, Parseval Lowell set out to uh, to find the famed Planet X. In fact, when you type in Planet X into Google, that notion tip actually dates back to this guy. Uh, so he spent uh, decades um, employing people to do the Leverrier-type calculations, and uh, his family was very wealthy. Uh, so I'm making this up, but this is probably exactly what happened. Uh, he probably one day woke up, went like, Dad, can you buy me a telescope? So Dad was like, yeah, I'll, come on. So he built him a Lowell Observatory, right? Lowell Observatory is uh, dates back from that time. Um, so right, Lowell spent his life looking for Planet X, published all of the calculations in uh, 19, 15 and then died in 1916. So the search for Planet X kept going, and the, planet, the man who eventually discovered Planet X was this guy, Clyde Tombo, who only died in 1997. This is a real picture of him standing by the telescope. This is a children's book version of his biography pitched at my intellectual level. So you can choose, uh, you can choose that or Wikipedia. Uh, so what Clyde Tombo found was really remarkable, right? If this is 1930 front page of New York Times, uh, Sunday edition. If you zoom in here, right, the discovery made it above the fold. It's a pretty big, pretty big deal. That's how you know it's a big deal, uh, right? It says here, astronomers hail finding the sphere possibly larger than Jupiter and four billion miles away meets predictions. Right, so Leverrier's miracle has been uh, successfully redone. Now we know that what Clyde Tombo found was not uh, a sphere larger than Jupiter. What he found was Pluto. And if you put Pluto on top of Australia, it fits. Right? So <laughs> it's, not, it's, not a big, uh, it's not a big deal. Right? Pluto is, is a really small planet. It's, it's, smaller than the moon by a large factor. 
So it's really sad, actually, in the way that the Planet X story unraveled. Okay, and it, actually, this, the interesting thing is that it was really put to, uh, put to rest in 1992 when the flyby data of Voyager 2 spacecraft was analyzed. Voyager 2 um, encountered Neptune and measured its mass directly. What was recognized is that we had the mass of Neptune wrong by half a percent. And if you fix it, then all of those residuals that uh, Parseval Lowell was chasing almost 100 years ago uh, simply go away, right? So Planet X was really killed by unmanned spaceflight. And I think because it was such a letdown um, in time, this notion that a planet can exist beyond the, solar, beyond the orbit of Neptune kind of downgraded itself to the point where if you talk about it, you're crazy. Okay, so this is a, uh, one of the first hits uh, from, from the internet, okay, uh, which, uh, which I pulled up on October 24th, 2015, so a little bit over a year ago, uh, when I typed in uh, something like planet beyond uh, Neptune, right? It says that uh, we're all gonna die because the planet X is coming in 40 days, and if you read uh, the comment section, right, then there's some real literary masterpieces of our time, right? And it says here, me and many folk with me have been waiting for this to show up for years, declares commenter Socrates Raramori. Ancient records state that once the destroyer is visible to the world, we have 40 days to prepare, uh, and it's definitely Nibiru, and it's time to freak out. So uh, what I'm getting to here is that if in 2000, I don't know, 13, somebody had walked into my office and said, there's totally evidence for a planet beyond uh, Neptune. I've been like, take what you want, okay? Uh, just, <laughs> just leave. Um, so indeed, we haven't found any planets uh, in the solar system, no matter, uh, no matter how hard we search the night sky. But what astronomers did discover is the so-called Kuiper Belt. And this is actually the thing that led to Pluto's the motion, right? This is the solar system viewed from top down. That little um, green, sorry, that little blue circle is the Earth. In pink, there are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Pluto is, uh, is appearing here. Um, <clears throat> right now, we're going to switch to the frame of the solar system, okay? go into, into the plane, into the ecliptic plane. And what's going to appear are all of the well-known, well-characterized Kuiper Belt objects, of which we now know uh, of thousands. Right there, they all are. Right. So, in the last two decades, concurrently with the discovery of extrasolar planets, astronomers have discovered that the solar system has another belt of debris, not just the asteroid belt, but the Kuiper Belt, um, which resides beyond the orbit of Neptune. Individually, each of these objects is not very significant. Individually, there may be um, the average size of these guys is about 100 kilometers, roughly the size of LA plus Orange County combined. Uh, none of these things are planets. They're just space debris, really, cumulatively. This belt um, only weighs about 0.1 Earth masses, so it's not a huge gravitational uh, deal, but the orbits are interesting. Right? If you look at all, each one of these orbits individually, they, um, they each tell their own story. Uh, some of them, including Pluto, exhibit chaotic motion, fundamentally unpredictable. This is actually really neat. We can't predict the orbit of Pluto 500 million years into the future. We know we have some statistical idea, but not the exact orbit itself, but if you were to examine each one of them, a uniting feature that you would find is that each of these orbits are gravitationally tethered to Neptune. They have the shape that they have uh, because Neptune says so, so to speak, right? Um, and one of the kind of interesting things that you can almost see by eye here is that at perihelion, at closest approach to the sun, all of these orbits hug 
the orbit of Neptune. Why is that? Uh, it, there's a simple explanation. Gravity is a conservative force, which means that um, if Neptune perturbs you, right, kicks you on this really long elliptical orbit, you must come back to, to the place from which you started. So these, all of these orbits evolve uh, chaotically in time, but uh, they're all gravitationally tied to the orbit of Neptune. So imagine the surprise of Mike Brown and company in 2004 when they found an object that, they, uh, that we now call Sedna. Right, this is the orbit of Sedna, and you don't have to be a sophisticated astronomer to kind of realize that something is, something is wrong. Right? First of all, at aphelion, at furthest approach from the sun, Sedna is a thousand times as far away from the sun as is the Earth. So it's really, really out there. Its orbit is really elliptical. But the really staggering thing about Sedna is that its orbit is not elliptical enough. Okay? Look at the closest approach. At closest approach, it doesn't go anywhere near Neptune. Okay? That's pretty, pretty remarkable and strange. Why? Because Neptune could not have emplaced Sedna into its orbit. If they never see each other, so to speak, then in fact, they never interact. And you can demonstrate this on your laptop, right? You can, you can code up the gravitational equations of motion and just evolve the system forward. All that will happen to Sedna is it'll just keep going round and round on its highly elliptical orbit, and the orbit will really slowly rotate. But that's it. So Sedna was the first hint in about 160 years that the solar system has, still has some tricks up its sleeve, and the distant, as we unveil the Kuiper belt, as we unveil the most distant orbits that we, we know of, some interesting uh, surprises are gonna appear. Now for a decade, Sedna was the only example of a so-called detached Kuiper belt object. Detached meaning that its closest approach is nowhere near the orbital radius of Neptune. But in 2014, um, a team of two astronomers, Chad Trujillo and Scott Shepard, announced the discovery of Joe Biden orbiting the, so the sun. <laughs> and this is Joe Biden's orbit, right? Um, so this object, which they, uh, they nicknamed Joe Biden, uh, also never comes anywhere close to the sun. Uh, in fact, at closest approach, it's even further away than Sedna. It's at 80 astronomical units. Um, it's really weird. Okay. In, uh, in science, if you have one data point that's weird, you tend to ignore it. Uh, if you have two data points that is weird, you make a really big deal out of it. Because um, <clears throat> it takes two points to, to draw a line. I think that's why. Um, so this was really the, the inspiration for our, um, for our work the work that, uh, that Mike and I have done over the last uh, three years or so. And it was, in fact, with this paper by Trujillo and Shepard that Mike, whose office is only a couple, down, a couple doors down from mine, so he didn't, it wasn't a dramatic stroll. Uh, but anyway, he, with this paper in hand, he came into my office and said, this is really weird. We should figure out what's going on. So we looked into it. And here's what we found effectively immediately. We found that if you zoom out in the solar system, and if you only concentrate on the most distant orbits, which include Sedna and Biden, then, then they all exhibit a really interesting clustering. Right? All of them roughly lie in the same plane. You could almost put a piece of paper through all of those orbits. And equally as dramatically, they all point to the right. Okay? So I know I'm gravitationally attractive, but not attractive enough to deform all those uh, Kuiper belt orbits. So this is, this is really weird. If orbits are clustered that way, something is doing it. Right? This is in stark contrast with the rest of the Kuiper belt where orbits were facing every which way. Something is gravitationally confining this set of distant uh, bodies. So what can it be? Right. 
Well, it can be a number of things, okay? Uh, you could say, first of all, the number of ellipses in that previous slide was not that big. It was like six, okay? And maybe you just randomly chose, you know, it just so randomly happened that the six most distant orbits that we know of are all pointed in the same direction. Could be a coincidence. Um, fortunately, we can calculate the statistical likelihood that that's the case, and it clocks in at about 0 0.007%, okay? So uh, it's not exactly a great gamble. Uh, could it be because a star passed near the solar system four billion years ago and kind of perturbed these distant orbits into, into an aligned cluster? If you make that argument, then that star would have passed by the solar system really recently, okay? And uh, the kind of rate of encounters with stars is incompatible with that idea. Why? Because if, as it turns out, if you take all of those orbits that are all pointing in the same direction and allow them to evolve forward, then they differentially process. They will all come out of this confinement in only 100 million years, a geologically short time. So something is keeping the orbits confined right now. As I already mentioned, if you talk about planets beyond uh, Neptune, you're kind of, chances are you're crazy. So we spent the first year of this project ruling out every possible, um, you know, every possible other mechanism that could have caused confinement. So um, I think my favorite model from our um, reel of outtakes is a model where um, we thought maybe the distant Kuiper belt actually has enough gravity where all of those pieces of debris are creating this mean gravitational field which is self-confining. And turns out that would even work if there was 10,000 times more debris out there than we know there is. So uh, it's, a cool, it's a cool calculation, but it uh, turns, out, turns out to be wrong. So having exhausted all reasonable, all normal uh, kind of models that we could come up with, we said, okay, what if we uh, join the land of the bloggers and um, you know, consider the existence of a planet? Because after all, you know, the only reason why, uh, why we hesitate with, with introducing planets is because it's failed so many times after Le Verrier got it right. Something that we immediately discovered is that um, you run into a problem. When you say, okay, we're gonna introduce um, a, a planet into our solar system, it's not clear where to put it, right? Or, or it's not even clear what its orbit should be. So the, uh, the thing to do is to make it up, right? So we, we thought, okay, what if, I don't know, all of these orbits face that way? What if we just introduce a planet into the cluster of the orbits? Maybe that'll keep them confined. Um, now the good news about this type of calculation is that you can pretty much do it um, on the board. You can do a similar thing to what Leverrier did. So, uh, so for the rest of the talk, um, <laughs> I wanna go through this in just painful detail um, the, the really, the important parts are these three terms here. Um, I, I'm not really going to go through. You know, I once, uh, I once gave this talk at a math department, and I made the similar joke, and they were like, no, 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 stop. This is the only slide that makes any sense. <laughs> um, so actually, I will say this about this calculation. With this calculation, you can, um, you can immediately find out a couple things. If a planet is causing the confinement that we see, then the planet must be at least 10 Earth masses. That's something that comes out of uh, this relatively simple set of calculations. And uh, another thing that you know is that the planetary orbit must be eccentric. You can't do it with a typical solar system type you know, circular orbit. Now, the good news about 2016 is that it's no longer 1846, despite, uh, well, um, so, so anyway, it's no longer 1846, is what I keep telling myself. Um, 
And we can, in fact, use the vast computational resources that are available to us here at Caltech. In fact, uh, the supercomputer that we use, the one hosted by the GPS division, is literally beneath me. It's two floors below my office. So, it was, uh, so this is what we did. We, we cr considered the following evolutionary picture. We thought, if the solar system started out with a ninth planet that had an eccentric orbit and um, about 10 Earth masses, um, and we started out with a Kuiper belt, this, this field of debris, which was initially completely random, right? It was occupied all of these eccentric orbits that went every which way. If we let it evolve self-consistently for the lifetime of the solar system, four and a half billion years, then would it produce the um, pattern that we see? And so you can judge for yourself. This is the simulation, not in real time, it takes like weeks for this to, uh, to compute. And what we did is we iterated on the parameters of the planet. We tried many, many different cases. This is one of the, the better outcomes. And right about now, so we're about two and a half billion years into the solar system's lifetime. Right about now, a pattern begins to emerge where you can see that the orbits are starting to cluster on the opposite side of the planet. Okay. Right? I'm not crazy. Right? You guys see this too, uh, certainly. Um, right? Typically, the orbits are, that are anti-aligned with respect to the orbit of planet 9 are the ones that survive. We now have a pretty good understanding of why that is. And as it turns out, the physical mechanism is, is that, uh, that of mean motion resonance. It's actually the same mechanism that keeps Pluto stable, um, even though Pluto's orbit overlaps Neptune's orbit slightly. So I won't go into the, the details of, of the physical picture, but just kind of empirically, you can, at this point, we're getting towards modern day, tell that, okay, indeed, the simulation is producing a synthetic solar system that looks a lot like the real one, right? And you can do the same type of statistics uh, on this synthetic solar system and kind of convince yourself that, that you're only mildly crazy. Um, so one of the things I want to point out as we rotate the set of orbits through is are these guys. See how these guys have come out of the plane quite a bit. We'll come back to those um, stragglers later. So what does this all mean? This all means that given that these are the real orbits, we can use their properties to calculate what the orbit of planet nine looks like. And it looks roughly like this. It's anti-aligned with respect to this cluster of distant ellipses. It lies roughly in the same plane as these distant orbits themselves. So it's inclined with respect to the rest of the solar system by about 20, 30 degrees. And it has a mass of about 10 maybe 15 Earth masses. That's pretty cool. Um, at that point, we had a good story, right? This was, I guess, about a year ago, maybe a little bit less than, maybe a little bit more than a year ago that we had attained these results. And we felt pretty confident because we had explained the existence of this clustering of the orbits. As it turns out, as the orbits rattle around within the cluster, some of them become detached, like Sedna, like Joe Biden, and then reattach back to Neptune. So what this means is that if you were to come back to the solar system 200 or 300 million years from now, then Sedna and Biden would go back to being regular Kuiper Belt objects. And some of those regular Kuiper Belt objects would detach and attain Sedna or Joe Biden type orbits. That kind of cyclic nature is uh, kind of satisfactory from a, you know, from an almost Zen point of view. And then we ran into this, okay? So this was, was a real surprise. Um, and this was actually already when we were starting to write up the paper that uh, we noticed that not only does Planet Nine confine the distant orbits into this cluster and cause them to periodically detach from the orbit of Neptune. It's also 
generating this type of dynamics. So on the x-axis of this plot, what's being shown is the physical orientation of the orbit, which way it's pointing in physical space. And on the y-axis is the inclination, the extent to which the orbit is inclined. Right? And these, these curves are just the theoretical paths that um, the model has produced. The staggering thing that you might note is just the range of the y-axis. It goes from zero to 180 degrees, and those, that mountain of, of trajectories reaches numbers that are like 120. What this means is that Planet Nine is taking some of those distant orbits and twisting them onto states that are effectively perpendicular to the plane of the solar system. So when I first noted this, I thought, well, maybe this is just a weird simulation. Turns out every simulation has this feature. This is actually the most robust effect of Planet Nine's dynamics. And I thought, huh, this is really odd, and wouldn't it be cool if one day somebody discovered a little Kuiper Belt object that was orbiting per, in a perpendicular sense to the, pla uh, to the plane of the solar system, that would be indirect evidence that Planet Nine really exists. So I took this down the hall to Mike's office, and I said, look what I found. And Mike said, um, should we see what DR30 does? And I said, is DR30 a street drug? In, <laughs> in which case, we should take it and see what it does. Um, Mike, turns out DR30 is not a street, uh, street drug, it's an asteroid. Uh, so Mike had noticed, right, somewhere in the, in the back of his mind that there was this discovery of, uh, of a body called 2012 DR30, which was in fact spotted crossing the ecliptic plane, the plane of the solar system, going from uh, south to north, I believe. So it was going perpendicular to the plane of the solar system. So we thought we would do the following experiment, because okay? you have to be honest with yourself. We took effectively this graph, right? put it on Mike's computer, and then said, we're gonna plot all of the data that's available, not make any cuts, not, not filter it anyhow, and see if there are any objects that fall into that, uh, into that structure that appears in the middle. And this is what we found. We found that, turns out, there have been five discoveries of bodies in the solar system, small bodies, right, 50 kilometers across, that orbit perpendicularly to the plane of the solar system, and they're exactly where the model is predicting them to be. This is what they look like in real life, right? If you zoom out of the solar system, as it turns out, uh, and kind of have a top-down view, they look like wings on which the solar system is flying towards you. But really, the staggering thing is, look at the orbit of this, of this guy on the right, right? It's huge, it's way bigger than the orbit of Sedna. And as it turns out, all of them were spotted by accident, okay, by a near-Earth asteroid survey. And the reason they were discovered was that a near-Earth asteroid survey sc scans the entire night sky, right? Um, it doesn't discriminate on where it's going to find bodies, whereas when you look for Kuiper Belt objects, you typically focus on the plane of the solar system because, well, you want to discover something and you know that nothing is going to be on a highly inclined orbit. So this was a really interesting moment uh, in the development of our story because the model made a prediction, which we confirmed 10 minutes later by dumpster diving into the data set. Uh, but this was the moment really where it went from just a cute story in our minds to, to I think, a theory where, where you can really start to believe that Planet Nine is really out there. So this was published um, in January and in August. I was on a run uh, with, my, with my iPhone, which is also serves as my iPod, and I got a call from a, from a nice woman who said, there's huge news about the solar system. This is in August, okay? And then we, they've discovered this object that totally revolutionized everything. It's called Niku. Uh, can you come on our radio show on Friday and talk about it? Can you 
research what it does and so that you can say some interesting things about Niku. And I said, okay. So I looked up what Niku is and they had found this body in the Kuiper belt, which was, again, individually not that significant, right, about 100 kilometers across, and its tilt, its orbital tilt is 110 degrees. They made a big deal out of the fact that it orbits the solar system on its side. And I thought, this is not a big deal. They just discovered another one of those perpendicular orbits, those really extended perpendicular orbits that our model predicted, right? It turns out, no. It turns out that's not what they found. They found something much more weird. Um, this, for scale, those blue orbits are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and that yellow ring is the orbit of Niku. It's totally not extended, right? In fact, its orbital semi-major axis, the size of its orbit, is roughly that of Neptune, okay? So it's completely unaware of Planet Nine. Planet Nine is so far away that it does not affect its orbit. I mean, an analogy would be, you know, that, that Niku is, Niku's effect, rather Planet Nine's effect on Niku is like, if you're standing next to a Marshall amp, um, you know, turned up to 11, and you're trying to make out what somebody's saying at the corner of the bar, right? It's just Planet Nine's effect is completely negligible today uh, on the orbit of Niku. So we were a little bit puzzled, right? Because uh, this is really interesting in its own right, even if it's not part of the Planet Nine story. <clears throat> but um, even if your logical kind of intuition tells you that this is not this phenomenon is not part of Planet Nine, you should resist that, okay? Because everything is always part of the Planet Nine story. <laughs> um, so we didn't stop, we continued calculating, and here's what we found, right? What we found is that some of those distant orbits can be turned into Nikus um, through, in the following way, All right? So again, now, this pink orbit is Planet Nine, yellow is just a random, a uh, Kuiper belt object that starts out in that type of orbital state. If you let things go, it will evolve in this rather unpredictable and crazy way where it will periodically tilt on its side, then go back into the plane. So we're gonna zoom in right now into the solar system. The biggest pink circle is Neptune. And notice how every time the closest approach reaches Neptune, the orbit shrinks. Right? And that's because this object is uh, suffering close encounters with the planets, and the planets are shrinking their orbit. So little by little, the orbit becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, and starts rotating like crazy. And eventually, when we're done, this body that we simulated, again, this is just this is a simple calculation. All, there's, all that's going on is GMM over R squared. It's just gravity, right? At the end of the day, uh, what Planet Nine does is turns these really distant bodies into highly inclined uh, members of the traditional Kuiper belt. So what we realized is that Planet Nine, even though it doesn't have a direct effect on these objects that are entrained in the current and kind of the closer part of the Kuiper belt, it has an evolutionary effect. So, so Niku used to be much, much further away in the solar system. Planet Nine caused its orbit to tilt and then encounters with Neptune and other giant planets shrunk its, uh, its magnificent orbit. So we thought, okay, maybe Niku is not alone. In fact, we knew that it was not alone because there was an object called Drac, which shared a similar type of orbit. Um, and we decided to look into the inclination dispersion of the Kuiper belt. So again, on the y-axis, this is the how inclined the objects are on the x-axis is the semi-major axis, how big the orbits are. Planet Nine's influence starts basically on the street outside of, uh, outside of this auditorium. Um, but if you just examine what the evolutionary effects of Planet Nine are, um, as it turns out, it explains every data point on this plot, okay? pretty remarkable, including that thing up there, all the way up there, which was just discovered in September. 
I think it's called 2016 NM56. So this is pretty interesting, right? The effects of Planet Nine could be felt effectively everywhere in the Kuiper Belt. But wouldn't it be cool if Planet Nine affected also something, something else, something outside of the Kuiper Belt? Turns out it does. And this was work which was led by a graduate student named Elizabeth Bailey, who's working with both myself and Mike. And the problem that the three of us tackled is the following one. That, okay, if Planet Nine's orbit is inclined by about 30 degrees, then what it'll do is it'll exert a torque on the rest of the planets. It will act to kind of misalign, very, very slowly misalign the plane of the known giant planets and the Earth and Venus and Mars and Mercury uh, from its initial orientation. And the reason we looked into this is because it's been known since 1850 that the sun is inclined with respect to the plane of the solar system by six degrees. And now, I'd say six degrees is not that many degrees. Um, and indeed, you would be right. Six is a small number compared to like 90. But six is a big number compared to one. In fact, by a factor of six. That's the, that's the kind of math that I can do, all right? And if you ask yourself, by what extent are the planets misaligned with respect to one another, the answer is less than a degree. So the sun stands out as a weird anomaly, right? It's, it's, it's spin axis, right? The sense into which it rotates is significantly misaligned with respect to the plane of the solar system. We thought, what if, okay, what if planet nine has over the lifetime of the solar system tilted the plane of the solar system by some number of degrees, right? What, I mean, a priori, we didn't know what that number was. It could have been 0 0.001, or it could have been 45, in which case we would have been in trouble. Turns out, if you plug in the numbers that we derive for planet nine from the Kuiper belt, that answer is six degrees, okay? If you take the current state of the solar system, and reverse time, okay, and compute the gravitational interactions that the giant planets uh, have with planet nine, then in four and a half billion years, the giant planets return to being exactly coplanar with the sun, right? So we think that the sun is tilted. It's actually our, our entire plane, or the plane of the solar system that's been slowly misaligned, right? I think that's pretty remarkable because what it means is that both the obliquity of the sun and the direction into which it's tilted is inherently connected, right? The thing that's at the center of our solar system, the way it's tilted is inherently connected to the most distant orbits that we know of, these Kuiper belt orbits and where they point and how they are tilted. And that connection is planet nine. So over the last year, additional uh, objects have been discovered. In the solar system, they all fit in beautifully with our, with our model. This is sort of the new uh, census of distant Kuiper Belt objects. Um, as you can see, the cluster that, that's anti-aligned with respect to Planet Nine uh, has gotten only more statistically significant. They have even found a couple objects that point toward Planet Nine, and that was a prediction that we made in the original paper, that such objects would in fact exist and Voila, they're there. Okay, so I'm out of time, effectively. Um, I want to quickly summarize the properties of Planet Nine. Planet Nine is on a really, really extended orbit. Its orbital period is about 20,000 years, right? Its eccentricity is unlike that of any other planet in our solar system, 0 0.6. We don't know how big Planet Nine is physically. But we know of a lot of exoplanets that are about 10 Earth masses. And those exoplanets routinely have radii between two and four times that of the Earth. And finally, we know that its orbit is tilted by about 30 degrees. What are the lines of evidence for Planet Nine, for the existence of Planet Nine? There are now five. Right? So in this talk, we talked about the clustering of the distant orbits. It explains that. 
Uh, it explains the detachment of Sedna type bodies, those weird objects that don't come to hug the orbit of Neptune, Sedna, Joe Biden, right? Really weird. Uh, it produces those highly inclined centaurs that were detected by accident, right, by the uh, Near Earth Asteroid Survey. And some of those objects over time evolve onto Niku type orbits. And finally, and quite dramatically, Planet Nine explains this long term, this long standing question of why is the sun spinning in a sense that's slightly misaligned with the rest of the solar system? So I think that the case for Planet Nine is pretty strong, and we are on the observational hunt for it, along with many other groups. Um, this is the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, uh, and these are telescopes. Uh, I'm not an observer, Mike is the observer, so uh, this part of the talk will be short and superficial. Uh, we are using that one to, uh, to try and find Planet Nine. When you go inside it, it's huge, okay? So there's the, the telescope itself, that gigantic metal blue thing. And uh, this is Mike, and that's me, right? So it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. Turns out, you have to stay up all night. Um, but I'll tell you where it is, right? So I only know of one constellation, because my cat is named Orion. So uh, I learned where Orion is. Turns out, luckily, Planet Nine is in the Orion constellation. So uh, that's the Orion constellation right here, and that star in the top right corner is not planet nine, but planet nine is really close to it, I think. Um, okay, I am completely out of time, so I think at this point I'll finish up and take any questions. Thanks very much.